maintain his presence right now. Keep your hands raised for a minute. Your loving kindness is better than life. Your loving kindness is better than life. Loving kindness is covenant relationship. It ties into a, a Hebrew word. It is also a chet word. It's about newness. It's about a brand new thing that God is doing in us right now in this new season. But it's also a reminder that He is faithful, that He is faithful to His promise, that He can take us to a new tomorrow because He's been with us through all of our yesterdays. And He's taken care of us. His loving kindness has been there. His tender mercies. Are you thankful for everything that God has brought you through? How many are thankful that God has been faithful to us? Touch somebody and say, He's faithful. He's faithful. Come on and clap your hands and thank the Lord now together. Hallelujah. Your mercy endures forever. These are all terms of covenant. They're all terms of relationship. And they're all terms of the character and the nature of God that he is faithful that he is trustworthy that he stands by his word that you you can lean upon him the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous runneth into it and are safe we're safe with him and loving kindness to me is such a wonderful term it's such a wonderful term and I, I love that love that song and his mercy endures forever. Praise God. Well, I'm going to tell you something that, that, that we, we understand here at TCT is that God is not only faithful to us in the spiritual things. He's faithful to us in everything. In everything. And uh, one of the ways that we prove his faithfulness is through our giving. How many of you have ever heard the term, you can't outgive the Lord? heard that term I used to hear that when I was growing up and I would just be marvel I would just marvel at it because our natural mind doesn't make sense it just doesn't make sense but that's why he says prove me and see if I won't do it and yet there are so many ways that God knows how to get resources to us when we need them or when there is a vision or a dream that he has given to us it's amazing how resources come to us it's people it's open doors it's favor it's finance he takes care of us and so when we remember his kingdom and put it first, when we remember his house, he remembers our house. Come on, uh, come forward tonight. We're going to give. I, I give. On, on, I text to give oftentimes. If you don't see me walking up, it's not because I'm not giving. I like to text to give. Uh, but but if you like to walk up and put some money in the in there because you like to do that, that's awesome. You can put a check or you can put cash in there. We receive it that way. We also take online giving. We have the swipe card if you'd like to do that tonight and use your debit. We don't recommend. Uh, you going in debt to give an offering but we do say if you want to use your debit card otherwise would you shake hands with a couple of people and say man it was cold outside but thank god it's warm in here and it's really good to see you tonight let's greet one another in the name of the lord pictures that you took in the snow get some good pictures with the ice it lasted this time more than one more than one half a day I think we still have a little bit of snow around our house so I think this is exceptional time it's an exceptional uh, time for us around here to see unusual things and if God is showing his handiwork in unusual ways in nature then how much more does he want to show his handiwork to us his people and do some unusual, supernatural good things. It seemed like in 2017, 
we were uh, trying to outrun trouble. <laughs> but in 2018, we're going to be overtaken by a blessing. Praise God. Would you clap your hands and thank the Lord for it? I want to teach something to you tonight. Since we're in prayer week, I want you to turn to the book of Judges. And uh, this is something that I, I love to teach this. It's one of my favorite, one of my favorite things to teach uh, from the Old Testament. I got a lot of Old Testament stuff I like to teach, but this is one, this is a really fun one. But there's so many powerful truths and principles. Judges chapter number three. And since it's during prayer week, I want to give you some tools. I want to give you some tools. I want to help you to be effective. Either we love prayer or we loathe prayer based on one thing. Effectiveness. Are we getting results? If you know your prayers are getting through and things are happening, you can't wait for the next time to get back into prayer again because you can't wait to get something else done. But if you feel like prayer is just an exercise and discipline and you're basically having a monologue with God, you're just sort of informing him of your life and you're not expecting any intervention at all, then you'll just end up uh, doing, doing the, the vain repetitions of just, just going through the motions. Uh, I don't believe that God wants relationship like that. I don't think that we want relationship like that. This is a dialogue with God. We are not just having a monologue. He is speaking, and, and, and we can listen to him. And if we can hear him, then he can also hear us. So that is the litmus test of current relationship with God. And I've already teaching. The current, rela current litmus, test, uh, relation, litmus test of current relationship with God is... Number one, I'm hearing God. Everyone say, I'm hearing God. Number two, God is hearing me. There you go. He hears not sinners, the Bible says. So my sheep hear my voice. So if you want to know you're in right relationship and you're operating and flowing in the Spirit, that's one way that you can find out. All right, Judges chapter number three. And the children of Israel, verse number 12, did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened the Lord. Everyone say, the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And for the sake of time, verse 14, so the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Verse number 15, but when the children of the Lord, children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon. Everyone say, a gift. A gift unto Eglon, the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length. That's 18 inches. This was a serious dagger. 18 inches, and he girded under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present, everyone say, he brought the gift unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. The Bible just says it plain. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present, but he himself turned again. From the, quarry, from the quarters by, that were by Gilgal, and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. And he said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in the summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose up out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from, from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. That was the word from the Lord. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. Then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. And when he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, Surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. And they tarried there till they were ashamed. And behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor. Therefore they took a key and opened them. And behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth, and Ehud escaped. I'm going to talk to you about secret agents with secret weapons. Secret agents 
with secret weapons. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, Lord, the living word will preach the written word. Help me to teach and preach and impart and help us all, O oh God, to be enlisted in your army right now in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. You may be seated for agent training. Tonight, you have been called up out of your deep reserves, and you have been enlisted to be a part of God's special forces. This is special forces training. If you come on a Thursday night in the middle of the cold after two nights of, of below freezing weather, you have serious passion for God. Touch somebody and say, I'm serious about this. The people that are going to get it done are the people that are serious about the things of God, that have a passion, crazy passion for his word. And so I want to, I want to give something to you tonight that will, that will help you. Now let's lay out the story. Let's tell the story, okay? And in the story, we'll start extracting the truths. The Bible says that Israel did evil again. So this was a period of time where they would do well, and then they would kind of regress, and they would do well, and then they would regress. And so what God would do is if they weren't hearing his voice, and if they weren't being obedient, he would send an enemy to them. He would create, uh, he would create a problem in their life that would prove to them their need for God, that would show them again why they should have been obedient, why they should have been following God. How many understand that sometimes problems come in our lives to wake us up to our need for God? How many know that sometimes that God allows things in our life because He loves us? What is He really doing? He's trying to woo them back to Him. He's trying to say, how are you doing without me? You're not doing so well, are you? Watch this. I can't protect you anymore if you're not being obedient, if you're not under my covering, if you're not submitted. You lose my protection. And so I, I'm just going to step back and let somebody else come. And the Bible says that, that it, was, it was Eglon. And so what God did was give them a picture of their spiritual condition. Oftentimes, the enemy that has access to us is the enemy that is actually reflecting the weakness of our flesh. And so, for them, what would happen is they had, they had gotten spiritually lazy, and they had, they, had, uh, they had relaxed their discipline, and so they were, in a sense, they were, in a sense, uh, in a very unhealthy place. And so God sends them, and the Bible says, just says it very plain, the Eglon was a very fat man. This was a picture. He was saying, this is what you're up against right now. This is what you're dealing with right now. The first thing he did was he took the city of palm trees. Palm trees are the trees that have flex in them. Is that when the wind blows, they will flex. They can lay almost completely flat. They will not break in a storm. That's why you'll always see in, in the pictures in Florida and down, and down in the coastline of Texas, you'll see those the palm trees. There's always a, a reporter there, and it's a palm tree in the background. You know why? Because they can handle it. The rest of the trees are breaking off, and they're sliding down the, you know, uh, sliding down the road, but the palm trees, they can handle it. And so what happens is when, when, we, when we become spiritually out of balance, when our flesh is, is, is out of control, what happens is we lose our ability to flow with the Spirit. We lose our flex. We lose our palm trees. We lose our strength in God. And so that's what he took, and he was, a he was inhabiting this. Now, what he did was exact tribute. So I'm going to let you live, but you're going to serve me now. You see, the reality is if we don't serve God, we're going to serve something else. We're going to have a master in our life. Something is going to be telling us what to do. Something or someone is going to be dictating to us. And God is trying to show us, if you would have stayed with me, and if you would have submitted to me, and if you would have been obedient to me, things would have been a whole lot better for you than how they are right now. And so it took them 18 years to figure that out. How long do we have to live with the problem before we decide we want to do something about it? 18 years, and then the Bible says, they cried out to the Lord. I'm thinking to myself, the second day that, that Eglon is in charge, I'm already crying. 
But this is a symptom of where they were. They did not have a habit or a thought process that they should cry out to the Lord. This is how they got in trouble in the first place, is that they had walked away from that relationship. And so if that's not been a part of your lifestyle, when trouble comes, you don't think that's the first thing I'm supposed to do. But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to get out of a problem, you have to look at it differently, and you have to respond differently, and maybe you might have to start doing some things that you weren't doing doing before and so the people of Israel finally said you know what we're the people of God and it's time for us to see a change and so they cried out to the Lord and the moment that they started praying God heard them. Aren't you thankful that even when we are in a state that is, that is not in right relationship, the moment we cry out and ask for help, he'll say, yes, I'll restore you. Yes, I'll help you. Yes, I'll bring you out. And it doesn't matter if it was a long period of time, even 18 years where they were away from God and they weren't doing the right thing. God said, it doesn't matter how long it is. If you will ask me, I will turn you around right now. If you will cry out for a deliverance, I will say send you deliverance right now and I know America has not been in the best state and I know that there are, there are parts of Pasadena that you can look at and say that doesn't look like they're really living the way they should but I'll tell you this the moment we cry out to God God will hear us and I have a feeling that the reason why we're having this special agents meeting tonight is because God is about to activate us because of some people that have already been asking for help that are reaching out and saying you know what I I'm tired. I'm ready for a fresh start. I'm ready for something new. I'm ready to get out of this rut. It's been 18 years. Well, 2018, here we go. There's our 18 again. In 2018, God says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to turn it around. Clap your hands and thank the Lord right now. <clears throat> so God allowed a problem. He strengthened Eglon. And now when they cry out, what does he do? Now he sends a deliverer. So he is never going to let you get into something that he doesn't already have an answer to help you get out of it. But he has to, we have to whip that thing a certain way. Whatever it is that we are standing up against for us, it is the spirit of depression. That's what, that's what has been hovering over Pasadena, has been a spirit of depression. So what do we have to do? We have to be the opposite of it. So they had a... They had a, a wrong mentality, and so God sent them somebody who was left-handed. Now, me happening to be blessed to be left-handed, I understand this text. Because left-handed people tend to operate more in their right mind. What that means is the right lobe of the brain tends to be used more by left-handed people than the left side, which is logic side. So the creative, intuitive side of the brain is the right side. And what God says is that what I'm going to do is that I'm going to send somebody that sees things from a different angle that is in his right mind, that comes from the left side that you're not expecting, that is going to be live, that's going to be intuitive, that's going to be, that's going to be quick, that's going to be sharp. In other words, he's reflecting what they lost. They lost the palm trees. But this man says, no, I know how to flow. I know how to operate. I have understanding, I have insight, I have wisdom. You see, the Bible says that wisdom is better than weapons. That, so before we go into this battle, we don't just say, well, God has raised me up as a deliverer and bless God every demon that I see, every, every enemy that I see, man, I'm just going to hack away at them, you know. And there are some people that feel that way about prayer and about spiritual warfare is that as soon as they go out to, as soon as they, they discover that there's a battle and there's a war, man, they just want to fight everything and fight everyone and there's a, there's a demon behind every bush. Well, you could probably find a demon if you go looking for him, but that's not the design that God has for us. Sometimes we have to walk past a whole lot of lesser level demonic spirits in order to get to the root cause of what's really there. You see, if, if Ehud would have picked a fight with the man who was the doorkeeper, he would have never made it to the king that was sitting on the throne in the summer palace. And so sometimes we have to learn to have some discipline and we have to learn how to have some wisdom. Touch somebody and say, we've got to have some wisdom. When I first started when I first started uh, getting into spiritual warfare, 
I was reading books on this, and I was hearing, hearing people teach and preach on it. And so I was really engaged. I wanted to make a difference. I started discovering the kingdom of God was so vast, and, and the battle was far beyond just what happened when we were at church. And uh, church was a place where we, where we expressed our faith, where we worshiped, where we came together, where we were encouraged, where we were instructed. But the real battle happened when we were in prayer. It, it happened when, when we were on our knees. And so I remember one day I was going through the, the, the Lord's school on prayer, his outline on prayer, you know, our Father which art in heaven and thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then it gets to that section right after repentance and forgiveness that it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Oh, man. When I got to deliver us from evil, man, I said, God, I'm taking the armor on right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, good about truth, best plate of righteousness. I'm getting ready. And I went, ah! And I just ran out there. And I was like, devil, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you and I take authority. You know, and I started going like this, you know, for about 20 minutes. I came back in and I had a big thing of grass on my helmet, you know, and my, <laughs> I had arrows all over my, my shield. I was limping on one leg. <laughs> I mean, I was bruised and beaten and punched, and I'd been knocked down. And, and I came back into the presence of God, and I said, God, I thought I was an overcomer. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you and I were praying along real good. And then you decided to go and pray without me. He said, I didn't tell you to go do that. When you did that, you were all on your own. <laughs> and I'm like... Oh, right, right. I just don't unilaterally just go out there by myself and just go uh, crazy, man. You know, can you imagine somebody coming out of the foxholes, you know, I'm going to get you, and the guy's up in the trees going, who wants him? You know, who wants him? That's foolish. He's not, he's not following any plan. He's not following any commands. And so it leaves you vulnerable. God does, not, God does not want us to just have this cavalier attitude of just attacking anything and everyone anywhere that looks evil. That's, that's not the whole point. But if we're going to be effective, if we're going to operate as uh, truly the way God wants us to operate, we don't start with the sword out. We have the sword with us. He strapped it to his leg. We don't start with the sword out. We start out with a gift. So he came with tribute money. It was the gift that they were supposed to bring. And that was what gave them, that's what gave him access. Because he was the one that was in charge of delivering that package to the king. He was the representative of the people of Israel. And so when he goes in, he's strapped but he doesn't let anybody know. He conceals his weapon. And folks, this was an 18-inch dagger. This was either a really tall guy or he had that thing strapped in such a way. I mean, can you imagine? I had, a, I had one out today and that was probably close to 18 inches. And it, 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 it would be difficult to walk. You would almost have to walk like this, you know, when you came in. I, I, don't, I was trying to figure out how to do that. He must have been a tall guy. Maybe he was just really tall. But he strapped that thing on, on his leg and covered it over so that the enemy that he was coming there to, to serve couldn't see it. And so what he came with, what gave him access, was his gift. Everyone say his gift. So what God wants us to do is he wants us to begin using our gifts. So the gifts of the Spirit are here to give us access. They gain us the, the, the entrance point into the devil's kingdom, into behind those closed doors. It, it takes us. So I use the gifts of the Spirit as my primary. That's how I start. I'm starting. If you're gonna, if you're gonna operate effectively, if you're gonna be a, a special agent in the kingdom of God, this is how it operates. You're operating in wisdom and you're operating with spiritual gifts. So what are you doing? You are praying for insight. When somebody brings me a situation, the first thing that I'm doing, I know there's an adversary there. I know there's a problem there. But the first thing that I want to do is I want to figure out what the root cause is. I don't want to just take out all of the, all the little demons that are around you because guess what? Those little demons are going to go tell all their little friends and they're going to come back. So I can't win 10,000 against you know, me versus 100,000 demons or whatever it is. They're going to wear me out eventually. <clears throat> I'm just going to be saying, my Lord, I'm just so tired of dealing with all this. 
and you just say, God, I, I'm going back to whatever else I was doing. I don't think I'm getting anywhere because I, nothing is really changing in the situation. I'm just pushing back stuff that's going to come right back again. Have you ever dealt with situations like that where you felt like you were pushing it back against things that you knew tomorrow was going to be right back again? And so what we have to do is we have to change the approach and we have to say, God, give me insight. Give me revelation. Let the gifts of the Spirit begin to operate in my life. Let me have something that will give me access to get past those guys at the gate. Because when they saw the tribute, they immediately just opened the gate and said, come right this way. And they literally let him walk right past. They came all the way, he came all the way to the king, presented it, you know, to the king, and the people that were in charge of the gift <coughs> took it away. And at that moment, he says, I'm here. This is where I wanted to be. If I can take out the king, I can take out the entire kingdom. I can wipe them out. I'm here to make one strategic strike that I'm going to hit him, and they'll never know it ever happened. You watch how, how awesome he was. You talk about a real assassin. This guy was a pro. He was so awesome. It was one stroke, and he didn't even leave the evidence of the blade. The blade was stuck up inside of, of Eglon when he gave it to him. Could not take his blade out. There was nothing even in his hand for anyone to know that he had done anything. He could honestly say, I don't know what happened. You can search me. I don't have a weapon. Locked the doors and escaped out through the back. And by the time they figured out that the king was dead, Eglon was already, I mean, Ehud was already blowing a trumpet and calling for the army. Now he changes to another style. He changes to another weapon, which is a trumpet. Still, still not using primary, which is a sword. He started with a gift and then went to a trumpet. So, so this, is, this is strategic strikes that we want. What I want to do is I want to be able to discern what's really going on. What is at the root of what you are battling? And when God reveals that to me, that's what I'm going out. That's what I'm going to take out. We're going to hit that thing. We're going to hit it really hard. We're going to wipe it out. It's going to be five minutes, and that thing is going to be dead. That's it. Boom, because I know what it is now. I know what its roots are. I know where it came from. I know, I know what, what it is. I know what to call it. I know how to rip it out in Jesus' name. And then I'm gone. Boom, I hit it, and I'm gone. I'm on to the next thing. I am in and out of that realm. There, we do not have to spend weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months. We are praying to get down to the root. How did this thing get in? How did it get its hold upon a city? How did it get a hold upon the psyche? How did it get a hold upon the people that are in this congregation? How did it get a hold on us? How does it act on me? How does it act on you? When it comes, what do you feel when it happens? And then what should our response be? Our response is not always to go, ah, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Our response is, give me wisdom, God. Give me revelation, God. Let me understand, Lord. Help me to see it. Oh, what is this doing? Oh, I'm just, thank you, Lord. Thank, okay, so what's my response supposed to be? Okay, thank you, Lord. Okay, wh what verse should I use? Okay, wh wh what is underneath the garment right now? Wh what is the word that I'm carrying with me right now? He called it a word from God. He said, I got a word from God. My sword is my word from God. My word from God is it's time for you to go. I have dominion. I have authority. Hallelujah. So this is what I want you to do right now. I want you to ask God that spiritual gifts will begin to flow in your life right now. I want you to ask God that, that he will begin to speak to you, that he will begin to give insight to you, that he'll begin to give understanding to you, that you can say, okay, Lord, help me to, help me to use this. Help me to use this Holy Spirit that you've given to me to activate your word at the appropriate time, at the right time. Lift your hands to the Lord right now. Would you do it?
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So it's a, it's a different way of praying. I understand. It's a different thought process. But I'm trying to introduce. I'm trying to introduce something to you that you're you're praying and you're listening. You're praying and you're listening. There's been a lot of times when what I will do, and maybe I can walk you through it, and make it make it something that will that will be simple to you. So what I do instead of praying around something, I pray through something. You've heard me use these terms before. Talk about praying through. What does that mean? That means layer by layer, I look at it and I talk about it in the presence of God. I dismantle it. I take it apart. And I say, okay, what's really here? Well, I feel this emotion. Uh, what's that emotion connected to? It's connected to this over here. What, why is it connected to this? What is that? And then sometimes I'm just praying about that right there. Okay, God, I have this emotion, but why is that emotion there? How come I feel that way? I've asked God that question lots of times, and then that's when I would get a response. I would get understanding. He would enlighten. Uh, oh, okay. So that's why that happens. Let, let, me, let me give you a, a practical example. When I, would, when I was a young minister and I first started operating in spiritual gifts, people didn't know what to do with spiritual gifts, especially uh, back in those days that was still a new thing. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot more, gained a lot more acceptance in, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s than it did maybe in the 60s when my dad was starting, but there was still a lot of apprehension. There's some apprehension now, but there's a whole lot more openness to spiritual gifts now probably than there has ever been. And, uh, but, but when I started off as a youth minister and they'd asked me to come and do a youth rally and I turned it into a healing service, uh, sometimes they would, they would not know what to do with me. And so I just, everywhere I would go, I, would, I was trying to pray for the sick. I was trying to help people. I was trying to minister in the gifts. And so um, I, would, I, I, would, I would come to this point of, of boldness where I would feel like, okay, I can step out. I can do it. I, I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the risk to just follow God and, and step out and do this. And, 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 man, when you use the word of knowledge, you can't make a mistake. If you make a mistake, that service is over. So if I read something wrong, uh, you know, I, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to damage a lot of people's faith, and it may affect my, my ability to, to have integrity with people and lead them if I miss, if I miss it. But if I'm, if I'm right and it's God and they do get healed, then that is the potential for a massive surge of faith and a great breakthrough. And so it is a spiritual rush every single time that you step out in faith and you tell something that you know that you don't know except by the Spirit, and it turns out to be right. And so I remember one night I had a preacher that was there, and he was really there to tell people that the gifts didn't, didn't operate and that I was, uh, I was a fake. And so I was walking the platform, and I said, God, what should I do? He said, call him out. And I said, Oh, okay. So I walked down the aisle and I said, sir, you're a minister, you're a pastor that's here. He goes, yes. I said, you just came to, to be a part of the revival. And I said, I know you got a few questions. I said, that's okay. I said, but you also have problems in your knees. And he looks at me and he says, I said, is that right? He goes, yes, that's right. I said, if you'll step out in the aisle right now, the Lord's going to heal you. And I prayed for him. I said, now bend your knees right now. And the dude bent his knees. He's like, whoo, my leg, my leg. He started going like, whoo, my God. He looked at his wife. He's just like, my God. After the service, he goes, would, would you come to our church? I thought, man, five minutes ago you hated me, you know. And it was because they didn't understand. That's all. They'd never seen it before. And so this was some of the things I would do. But and after you operate like that, and after you minister to people like that, there would be a retaliation that would always come. There would be some kind of a spiritual retaliation that would come. And sometimes it would just be a simple word. I would, it, it's like when you open up faith like that, uh, it, it, it is so much uh, beyond where you are that, that at that point of my life, at that season of my life, I was pretty fragile still. In my own identity and so I, I I didn't know what people were really thinking about me and I had to die to whether it mattered at all I had to be willing to just say I'm gonna do the will of God regardless of whether people like me or don't like me but you know I think most of us if we have to choose between being liked or not being liked we will choose being liked how many how many would rather be liked anybody here would rather be liked? <laughs> and so that is the vulnerability and so then somebody would come to me and say, sort of in hushed tones, you know, Brother Cisco, there were some people in the back that really were saying some negative things and didn't know what to think about. And, uh, and then they would say, you know, that one guy that you prayed for, you told him he had back problems. He also had, and you missed it. You didn't see that he also had a gallstones. 
And I'd be like, oh my goodness, I missed something. I didn't see that. Well, how come God, how come I couldn't see that? And I, it, he also had an ulcer, you know, like, oh my God, oh my goodness, you know, God. You know. And I would go back and I would hit the floor in my room and I'd cry and I would say, oh God, oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm, I want to be a better servant. I want to be a better minister. I want to help people. I, I was just trying to do your will, God. I was just trying to do your will, God. And then I would just be beat up for a while. I wouldn't even attempt to operate. I'd go a couple of weeks sometimes, preach revival, hardly ever, wouldn't even let anybody know, wouldn't tell them any stories, would say nothing. I'd just preach the word, and, and I was hope that the gifts would start operating again at some point, but I didn't know. I really thought that what was hitting me, I really thought that that was somehow God in his correction. And what it was, it was a retaliation from hell that was masquerading as someone who meant well that was trying to help me, but it actually was a deceptive voice of the adversary trying to destroy my confidence. And so, <clears throat> long story just a little bit longer, I was trying to process this. I was trying to fight against it, but I was trying to process it. What is this? And so I would, I would finally work my way through it. I would try to... To, I would overcome, God would give me strength back in my spirit, and then I would say, you know what, I, I know that God's called me to do this, I know that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, and I would get back up the courage again, I'd go out, psh, man, there, the gifts would start operating again, it would be amazing, things would happen, and I, man, I'd be, I'd be flying high again, man, it's all, and then, oh no, here they come, I, I would just start bracing myself after the service, here, here they come. And there'd be that one person, that one or two well-meaning person. And it's usually someone who has some kind of credibility. Uh, <clears throat> and they're coming to tell you, oh, my goodness, it would hurt so bad. And uh, I remember one day I, I had a revival like this. And, and I literally laid on the floor. And I said, God, please make me David Bernard. <laughs> please make me David Bernard. Everybody loves his books. And he's an awesome teacher. And just... Make me normal like some of these other guys. God, why did I have to have all these gifts? And the Lord spoke to me and said, you asked me for these gifts, and I gave them to you, and I'm not going to take them away. He goes, now go out there and use them. And I'm like, God, but this keeps happening. He said, you need to operate in love, study love. And so I stopped everything I started just studying the love of God, studying the love of God, studying the love of God, so I could understand what was happening with people, so I could connect with people better, so I could, I could grow in my own spiritual life and my own maturity. And so that I would be secure in God, regardless of what people said. And then I remember, after some of these revelations about God's love and security, I went to preach for Jeff Arnold, 1991. And he got off the plane, and he had just preached a powerful message because of the times. And he got a lot of feedback, a lot of flack for it. He was talking about grace. And I was there, and I loved it. I thought it was awesome. I thought it was a word from God. And he was pretty much flying high. But then what I didn't realize is that when I went to that city where he was, I was tying into the same battle that he was tying into. Is that I was fighting the same spirit that was also fighting him. I had not done anything. All I did was have a conversation with him and go to my hotel room. I had not operated. I didn't try to say anything from God to him. I had not tried to operate any gifts. But I had the same feeling. Like somebody had hit me in the head. And for the first time, instead of crying and going, Oh God, I'm so sorry. Please help me to be a better man of God. I stopped and I went, Wait a minute. I don't think God operates that way. That's not how God works. What did I do to deserve that? Where did that come from? What happened? And I stopped at, right there and I said, I just stopped and said, God, what was that? I had never asked them before. I had automatically assumed every single time that that was somehow God's correction or that was, a, that was someone that I had offended or someone that I had hurt and I needed to go make it right and I needed to go repent and I needed to apologize and I, and I needed to go back and stop trying to be, because I was being arrogant by stepping out and trying to operate in gifts and who do you think you are and all this stuff was thundering in my head and none of that was God. 
Every time you break through into something, there's going to be an adversary there that's going to try to put you back in your little box, try to send you back to your place of ineffectiveness and tell you it would have been better off for you not to have stepped out in faith. But I came to tell somebody here, the devil is a liar and the father of all lies. And sometimes we have to stop and we have to ask God. And you know, if we will, he'll tell us. And right at that moment, right at that moment, I stopped and I turned around and the Lord let me see. The spirit was bigger than the door frame. It walked right through. There was a spirit, so it walked through the wall. <laughs> it was taller than the door frame. It looked about 10 feet tall and had a little billy club in his hand. And he was just popping it on his hand like this. Like, like I just hit him. And the Lord said, that is the spirit of tradition. And this is the same spirit that's been fighting you for all these years. And I went, wow, so I'm not crazy to want to resist that, to want to stand up against it. Now I knew what it was. Now I understand what it was. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I am not going to be intimidated. I thank you, God, for the gifts that you've given me. I know they're not mine. I am not trying to take credit for, what, for the glory that belongs to you. I'm just trying to be effective in your kingdom. And I thank you, God, if he came here to try to hit me, it's because, it's because you're going to do something great tomorrow. So, God, I'm asking you to pour out your spirit. Let the gifts operate. Let there be miracles. Send your angels. God, do a work and then all of a sudden he said no it's not just you it's the pastor I want you to pray for him right now and I started praying oh God now I understand it's not all about me it's about the people here it's about the movement and then all of a sudden I realized how many other people is this same spirit hitting and then oh it just keeps boom 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 revelation 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 and then God starts giving me scriptures and he starts un unwrapping this whole spirit and how it operates and then a month later God sends two angels to me and says these two angels break tradition in the church to hinder that tries to hinder the move of God and this is how they operate I want you to send these two angels into the church Phew. and I watch those angels begin to operate in my ministry and I begin to watch my life begin to change as I begin to break that but I and before I ever got to the blow of spiritual authority of taking dominion I had to have enough insight and I had to have enough gifts and I had to have enough I had to have enough word from God to be able to help me to understand what it is that I'm trying to take out if you don't know the specific thing that you're trying to take out you are not going to get results general prayers get general results specific prayers get specific results so when we start operating like this I'm gonna tell you, you talk about you talk about being powerful you talk about a church that can change things you talk about intercessors that know how to get stuff done what I'm telling you secret agents tonight is that when you are when you are authorized when you get your badge when God sends you out to do this when we leave these these doors tonight and you say you know what I just got a training I just got developed God just did something something just made sense the next time you get in the spirit and the next time you get an intercession and the next time somebody says I need you to pray about this instead of just going oh God in Jesus name I pray against that problem right now Jesus name, you're gonna stop and go Lord help me to understand how should I view this what's happening here what's going on here what and, and it may be something entirely different than what they just told you it may be that they think that's the problem but it's something else and God will cause you to use that gift to get past all of the other distractions to find out what the root is so that you can have a strategic prayer that you can pray one effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman is going to avail much and take out the enemy hallelujah 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 am i helping anybody tonight is this making sense for anybody tonight <laughs> So God taught me this principle many, many years ago. He taught me this principle, and it's something that I have used ever since about <laughs> concealing your weapon in the beginning, not making your default warfare, is that we get to the warfare, but I wait. I wait to get to the warfare until I know exactly what I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to take it out, the prayers that I'm supposed to pray. Because I believe that if I'm praying the way I'm supposed to pray, Jesus didn't wrestle with demons for very long. He just said, come out of him, thou dumb and deaf spirit. 
Now, we see that the disciples wrestled with that thing all afternoon. Because they didn't have a clue. They didn't ask any questions. What did Jesus do in Mark chapter 9? He walks up, and the guy says, Oh, Jesus, I brought my, my, my demon-possessed boy to your disciples. <laughs> they couldn't cast him out. He throws him in the fire. He throws him in the water. And if you can do anything, have compassion. And Jesus stops and says, Wait a minute. I'm not going to talk to the boy. I want to talk to the dad. When did this happen? Well, when he was a child. Uh-oh. So it's not the problem in the boy because the dad is the one that's the spiritual covering over the, over the child when he's a boy. So that means it was a problem in the dad that let the spirit into the boy. The boy would have never had the demon if the dad was in right relationship. So, okay. So the problem is, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. He goes right to the faith of the father. He doesn't, he doesn't even speak to the demon-possessed boy. Does not even look at him. What is he doing? He starts with his gift. He starts by asking questions. Does that make sense? And so, so he says, oh, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. There it is. He admits it. He confesses it. And he says, I have unbelief. I've been wrestling with unbelief. And he says, okay. We'll deal with the unbelief in you, and the demon will go out of your boy. As soon as the man repents of his unbelief, he then turns and says, thou dumb and deaf spirit. He knew exactly. How did he know? By the spirit. Thou dumb and deaf spirit, come out of him and enter no more into him. And he rents him sore and he goes out. And everyone looks at him and goes, wow, that was amazing. And, and the disciples say, man, we tried all afternoon to do that. We couldn't get anywhere. We couldn't break through any of that. That's because you started with your default by just running into the battle screaming at the demon. Here's a demon-possessed boy. Would you, would you pray for him? In the name of Jesus! In the name of Jesus! Come out of him! Come out of him! And he's just going, Aah! And I think sometimes in our zeal, that's kind of what we do. You know, we just think that if we yell, it's going to make the devil want to run, you know? But, but I, I want to have understanding. I want to have revelation. I want to speak with authority. I want to speak with confidence. I want God to show me what's really going on in this situation. That will help me. Uh, Brother Barnes tells a story, and I'll, and I'll close with this. Brother Barnes tells a story that uh, in Louisiana camp, he used to be the principal of, youth, of, of the uh, Louisiana youth camp for years and years and years and years. He was the principal. And I thought that was really cool, you know, that Brother Barnes was the, was the camp principal, you know. But he wanted to be with the young people, so he wanted to pray over them and see them. And so one night there was a girl flopping around and acting like she was demon-possessed. Everybody thought she was demon-possessed. Man, they were shaking her, and they were rebuking the devil. And, man, they were just, man, she was just, it wouldn't go out. Didn't seem nothing would change. She was still violently doing all this stuff. And, and finally they, they sheepishly came to Brother Barnes and said, you know, we've been trying to cast the devil out of this girl for a long time. Can you help us? And he walked in like this, and he told me the story himself. He said he walked in there, and he went, went down and whispered in her ear. If you don't stop doing that, you're going to really get a demon. She didn't even have a demon. <laughs> he said, but if you don't stop doing that, you're really going to get one. He said, she just stopped immediately. She sat up and went and sat on the pew. And everyone went, wow, man, Brother Barnes just whispered in her ear and the demon left. She just wanted attention. That's all she wanted. She was loving all them people just praying over her. She was loving all that attention. He said, but she was about to open her spirit up to it. I just told her to stop. I was like, that was so cool, man. That was so awesome. Because he knew what to do. Because he was operating in gifts. He was operating in revelation knowledge. He was letting God lead him. I think our biggest battle, no, remember this, the biggest, the biggest battle is not over territory. It's over you seeing. It's over me being able to see. It's over the church being able to understand what's really happening here. What is really going on here? What, what is the root cause? Why, why, why is this happening, God? Because if I can pray the right prayer at the right time, I can change that situation. God does nothing except in response to a prayer. So there are prayers that he's waiting for us to pray so he can do the things that he promised for us that he would do. 
It's just that we don't know what we don't know. So we don't know how to pray. And that's why sometimes praying in the Holy Ghost is the best tool that you have. Because the Bible says we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Speaking in tongues is not just an evidence of the Holy Ghost. It is the means by which oftentimes the Spirit says, I'll take it from here. Let me just speak to this situation, and I will address it, and I will take care of it. You just surrender and yield yourself to me, and I'll take out that adversary. Hallelujah. I can tell you stories about that all night long, about accurate and specific things that the Holy Ghost says to address situations. And if we did not have someone there that, know, that knew the language we were speaking, we would have never known what the Holy Ghost was saying through us. But I've had it on multiple occasions where I was speaking a known language by the Holy Ghost, and someone there that knew that language heard it, explained what the Holy Ghost was saying through my mouth, and I was just shocked because I had no idea. To me, it just sounds like la, 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 la. You heard me talk about the story in Kansas City where the, the three ladies speaking Arabic and, and the Holy Ghost said through me in Arabic or Aramaic, it said, hello, God, this is Debbie, and she has three problems. This is her first problem. This is her second problem. This is her third problem. Take care of them, Lord. Thank you. I just thought I was speaking. Oh, la, 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 la. That's what it sounds like to me. La, 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 la. Lady sitting back there, we didn't know you knew Arabic. And the Lord says to me, Aramaic. I says, no, it was Aramaic, just like that. I said, but it's by the Holy Ghost. They text me back later. Yes, it was Aramaic. There was a few words. We wrote them down. We looked in our dictionary. Do you know what you said? This is what you said. And I thought, isn't that amazing? God knew the three problems that she came up there. She wouldn't tell me it was wrong. She said, just pray over me. I'm like, okay, I'll just pray in the Holy Ghost. I prayed in the Holy Ghost. God said, here's the three problems. Take care of them. I was like, wow. Every single time we pray in the Spirit, that's what's going on. That's what's happening. There are things that are being addressed, things that are being spoken. And then when we get engaged in spiritual gifts, then the Lord starts letting us in on it, and we speak it in the language that we know. And so that's what's happening. As we're developing and as we're growing, God is opening up our minds so that then we go, okay, now, how should I pray it? Then he gives us in English, or maybe your primary is Spanish. He gives that to you, and you begin to say that out loud and that's where it gets reinforced because you have understanding that goes with the spirit bringing the revelation hallelujah and that helps us to take out the adversary would you stand with me right now i am determined this year that i want to equip you better than i have ever equipped you in the whole time that i have been here i want to load up everybody that is hungry there are some times when I have felt like, well, maybe some people are not ready for this. But you know what? I believe that there are more people that are hungry for this and hungry to go deeper and want to know how to be more effective and effectual. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to feed the people that are hungry to go farther and go deeper because it's time for this church to be effective. I don't want to just come and take up time and space. I want to know that we're getting something done every single time we're together and every single time you're in prayer. I don't want you to be frustrated. I want you to say, Pastor, it happened again. I was praying and just like you were talking about, God started giving me insight as to what I was saying. I started praying this way and then God redirected me over here. And then you know what? I went and called them and talked to them and that was exactly what was going on. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Are you ready? I want you to agree with your fellow secret agent right now. Amen. Agree with somebody close by you. I want us to pray that the spiritual gifts, the nine gifts of the Spirit, will operate in our prayer lives. Would you do that? Would you pray that? Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus that spiritual gifts will begin to operate in our prayer life. God, that you will begin to speak to us when we get up in the morning. Let us get impressions, oh God, when we go about our business. When we're riding down the road in the car, impress us with things to pray. God, direct our thoughts, oh God. Open up our understanding. Let the word of wisdom flow through us. Let the word of knowledge flow through us. Let the discerning of spirits begin to flow through us. 
God, I'm asking you in Jesus' name, activate the prophetic word and put it in our mouth. Oh God, diverse kinds of tongues. Let us speak in the spirit. Let us pray in tongues. Let us pray building up ourselves in the most holy faith. Your word says that there is a spiritual, there is a spiritual gift of tongues. Oh God, and that's for the edification of the body. And that also means it's for the edification of the believer. So God, I pray that you let the Holy Spirit in us, oh God. Let it stir up the gift that is within us and then give us interpretation. Help us to understand what the Spirit is saying through us and to us. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the gift of faith will begin to operate, that we will be able to release faith, that we will not only receive faith, but we will release faith in Jesus' name. God, we're praying for the gifts of healing, and we're asking you, Father, in Jesus' name, for the working of miracles. God, that there will be supernatural acts of God that defy the laws of nature. Let the spiritual gifts, the nine spiritual gifts, let them be released into the body. Let them be released, oh God, into our prayer life. Let them be released into our home group meetings. Let them be in decency and let them be in order. Let them not be outside of alignment. But God, I pray that it would be an expression of our alignment. In Jesus' name, give us insight so that we can be more effective in the Spirit. In Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Say it one more time. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now go ahead and clap your hands. Everybody clap your hands to the Lord. Jesus, the name above.